So were you able to hear me speaking just a minute ago? Good morning, Myra, I can hear you. Okay, so um, I can see that we're still admitting a few people while we're, uh, uh, while I'm speaking here, it is time for us to begin. And so I want us to get started on time, if at all possible. I, uh, I'm delighted to see this nice group of people who already gathered. I'm wondering if Dean Jung can hear my voice, if he would like to say hello before we get started. Yes, I can hear. So um, I I uh, will I will officially welcome us here um, and uh, get us started. Then, um, if if I may, I uh, am very honored to be uh, participating as I am today in talking to you about this very important topic of book challenges and censorship. Um, um, it's uh, very generous of Dean Jung and uh, Slim to host this event, and we're so glad that you could attend. I uh, did a similar type of session just last week with a group of students in a student forum, and uh, there might actually be a few people uh, in this group today who were present for that student forum. Um, the reason I mention it is that I uh, the in the first session, I really had um, MLS students in mind when I spoke to them. And today, I really uh, imagine that many of you in this audience are uh, practicing library personnel. And so I'm really hoping that I can um, share some details with you that you will find um, relevant to your own situation, whatever that is at this point, and that you will be able to make use of this PowerPoint going forward. In the chat, I put my email address, uh, and I'm hoping that you will make note of it and um, send an email message to me right away if you'd like to have the PowerPoint slides. I really hope that you, many of you will ask for them because there are certainly lots of uh, references that you might want to look back to um, beyond this, this session. And so um, I think many of you know me already, but for the good of the cause here, I'll just say again that I am Myra Dow. And can we start the recording? I believe we already have. I, I'm Myra Dow, and I'm a professor of library and information science at Emporia State University in the School of Library and Information Management. I'm not educated as an attorney. I want to make that perfectly clear. My educational background is in teaching and librarianship, and I uh, come at this uh, issue um, hopefully much like a professional librarian would. Uh, looking to reliable sources of authority, staying current with the situation at hand, and being a part of the, um, the discussion that's going on around what's happening in our society today. I certainly have had uh, lots of opportunities for interactions with people who are uh, living this particular uh, era and the uh, frequency of um, uh, book challenges and um, banning of books. And so I feel that I'm really well aware of what's going on and how critically important it is that we um, address the issue with the very best resources that we possibly can. And so throughout our time together today, I'm going to be uh, trying to answer what I think are two really essential questions. And the first one is, is why do people challenge books in an age when there's ubiquitous access to books? 
And just coming through the challenges of the pandemic, uh, it's certainly been a trend in public libraries to um, relax many of their rules for um, circulation of materials, increasing opportunities for people all around the country, regardless of where they live, to get library cards, even at some of the our country's biggest libraries. There's books in many different formats, and there are many different ways to get them. So I think it is definitely uh, fair and safe to say that we are living in an age when there is ubiquitous access to books. The second essential question that I want to talk about is how should frontline librarians respond to book challenges? And I'm using the word frontline librarians because many of you are on the front line of libraries and you are uh, engaging uh, with people who have something to say about what's uh, available sources in the library. And so some of you have a Master of Library Science degree. Others have master's degrees in other fields. And some of you uh, are um, working perhaps without very much formal background about what is meant by professional librarianship. And so I want to be sure that everyone who's listening today, either right now while we're making this recording or who will listen when the recording is finished, that this information that I'm sharing is for everyone who is a, a library personnel. And and I'm doing my very best to, um, to talk to you about it in a way that will hopefully um, make some sense and be useful going forward. So in the next few minutes, I want to mention to you some definitions of some key terms, including the term intellectual freedom. I'd like to share with you a few things that I think are really significant about the American Library Association. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some reading practices and beliefs about reading uh, over time, and I'm hoping to um, share with you what can librarians do whenever they're faced with book challenges. So again, throughout this PowerPoint, there are a number of resources uh, highlighted with the with the the access details so that you can get back to the sources. There were some even on that first page there at the bottom that I just mentioned. And I'm pointing that out because I want you to know that I haven't just pulled these details out of thin air. And that when I said that I've really been interacting with people that are engaged around this topic, I want you to see plenty of evidence that that's the case. According to the American Library Association, efforts to ban books has increased dramatically in the uh, in the last year in 19 in 2021. And what we know about that, because the American Library Association does keep track of these sorts of details, is that um, individuals and partisan advocacy groups are targeting libraries, schools, and library boards, and they're really trying to uh, redefine obscenity and the concept of what it means when we say harmful to minors as it's outlined in the law. So these are, uh, this is what we're seeing, and we also know from the records that are kept that the issues typically have to do with gender, sexuality, race, ethnicity, and then many other human differences are being targeted, including um, issues pertaining to immigrants, for example. It's very clear already this year that the efforts this year will surpass that high number of efforts that we saw in the past year. So 
here are some terms that I think are really important for us to have in our mind's eye as we approach this important topic. These are terms that are frequently used by library personnel and or people in the public, but they're not always well understood. So let's just take a, um, a minute and do a brisk walk through these key terms. Book challenges, what's meant by that? Well, that's just in an attempt to remove or restrict materials from public institutions. And uh, it is it, 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 it is an actual challenge, but it's not just a matter of sharing one's point of view. And so that it's someone saying, I don't care for this book and I don't think anybody should read it. Banning, on the other hand, is the removal of materials from public institutions. And censorship uh, is, uh, it is the, the possibility when someone succeeds in stopping circulation of certain cultural goods within a community by passing local laws that certain cultural goods be removed from public institutions. And so uh, in censorship, something is withheld from another person. This definition uses the word culture, and I want to mention uh, the term culture. We have learned a lot about culture in the recent past from many sociologists, and I believe that we have some really good understandings. Um, typically, we think of culture as the customs and beliefs, art, way of life, and social organizations of a particular country or group. And so I want you to be thinking about culture that way as we talk about these other details going forward. And then intellectual freedom is a term that we use quite often, and it is the right of every individual to both seek and remove inf receive information from all points of view without restriction. And many have said that intellectual freedom comprises the bedrock of freedoms of expression, speech, and the press, and relates to freedoms of information and the right to privacy. So that's what we mean by intellectual freedom. In the library field, we uh, are focused and care a great deal about intellectual freedom. So let's talk just a minute again, still about um, censorship. And I want to point out that many say that there are there is both active and passive censorship. And so think about these uh, various ways that each one can take can happen as you think about your own situations. Active control or active censorship can be done through redaction, which means marking through something, restriction, which limits, constrains, or controls uh, what one can read, and then uh, relocation and label, labeling, that's the actual removal from the author's intended audience. And um, it's also the act that, sometimes happens when librarians put labels on materials, uh, such as indicating that a certain group of books are for adult readers, or a certain group of books is about witchcraft or any other genre or category. That is an active act of censorship. And then also removing or taking uh, an item from the collection is, is an the, the ultimate active step of, of censorship. Passive control, on the other hand, is when we engage in self-censorship. And um, this is, uh, for example, if I choose not to read something due to my own personal bias. And so I have to admit to you, as I often do to my listeners, that I do believe that at times I personally censor myself. And uh, if we're all really honest with ourselves, we likely say that, that we do that at times. In the recent past, I've known of some 
really tragic situations that have happened in society. Um, they're, they're situations that are not just in the news, but happening to people whom I uh, know uh, personally or that someone I know knows personally. Those situations are very hard for me to think about uh, in the reality as they're happening. And I'll have to tell you that I'm just not able to read books uh, at, at times that have to do with uh, with crime and, and mistreatment of people. I also know that as a teacher, when I choose not to use materials in my courses because I'm afraid of public opinion, that then too, I'm engaging in self-censorship. This is a real, um, this is a real situation that many of us face. And certainly those of you who are working in schools and libraries now are likely to be thinking about this reality of being afraid to use certain materials for fear of public opinion. But just keep it in mind that we do self-censor ourselves and that, that we must be conscious of, of that action. So the last thing on this slide is a really important point, and that is that censorship is negative when done for others based on the belief that the materials will corrupt, offend the unsuspecting reader, or undermine moral values. So about censorship and culture, I just want to make the important point that whenever we censor materials, we're likely to be um, uh, preventing some members of our community from having information that's particularly culturally relevant to them. And so just for the sake of making that point, what I have on the screen here are some categories of culture as they're uh, typically outlined in things like the U.S. Census, for example. So um, under race and ethnicity, you see some examples of uh, terms that describe race and ethnicity. I have a, a short list of religions and a short list of social groups. And so these are all uh, details, examples of culture that we need to remember are a part, uh, likely to be a part and very um, relevant to many people in our communities who are in the library's community. So I'm switching gears here just a little bit as I talk about these key words and important concepts. I want to remind you of some publications or at least mention them to you that I think are really necessary as we continue to learn beyond this brief overview of these key terms that I've shared with you. On the left is a new publication. It's the 10th edition of the ALA's Intellectual Freedom Manual. On the right is a new book by Dr. Emily Knox, just published uh, this year. In fact, mine just copy just came in the mail just a few days ago. I'd been on the waiting list for it. It's called Foundations of Intellectual Freedom. And then I'd also like to call your attention to this book called Book Banning in the 20, in 21st Century America. This is also written by Dr. Knox, but this copy is a part of the Beta Phi Mu Scholar series. So all three of these sources are sources that have been published by, um, by uh, authorities in our field. And they're very current and they're very useful in my view toward learning um, still more about these key terms that I just shared with you today. I'm switching gears a little bit and I want to point out to you the importance of the American Library Association. Uh, we talk about joining it, we encourage um, uh, students to join the student chapter of the American Library Association. We promote the materials from the American Library Association. We encourage people to attend conferences and, and sessions scheduled 
by the American Library Association. And that's because the American Library Association is the large uh, organization that supports the profession of librarianship. And whenever you think about the importance of this um, term, we just said intellectual freedom, I'm hoping that you can imagine that it's really important in our society to maintain and practice um, the legal tenets of the law and to do it with the kind of support that we need in a world where there is uh, will always be controversy. And so I just want to remind you that the American Medical Association, they have uh, the, that physicians have the American Medical Association, the, the um, attorneys have the American Bar Association that supports their practice and we have the American Library Association. So um, the, the reason the objective, the object of the American Library Association is um, to promote library services and librarianship. And the stated mission is to provide leadership for the development, uh, promotion and improvement of library and information services and the profession of librarianship in order to enhance learning. And here's the important part, ensure access to information for all. So um, I just want to mention this. I have a, an a idea that many of you are well aware of the importance of the American Library Association. But lest we take it for granted, I want to bring it up in this context and remind you that our that that the ALA has everything to do with helping us to make progress in society, certainly around this uh, critical and important issue. I also want to mention that the American Library Association has established that all libraries must have a mission statement, and that mission statement. Um, uh, should clearly indicate what the library would do would do would be if the mission statement was achieved, and uh, it should include a list of values, its commitments, goals that will help the library achieve its mission statement. And at a minimum, a mission statement is needed to provide guidance for all efforts of the library. And so, it's really important. Uh, everyone to have a well-stated and highly visible mission statement. And uh, whenever we're facing controversy, it should be one of the first places we looked to be clear about what it is that we intend to do. I have visited many um, library websites and I know full well that in a state like Kansas, where there are lots of small rural communities, uh, public libraries don't always have the best of services or resources for maintaining their own website even. So it's, it's a big challenge at times to keep the website updated, but it's really an important um, thing that we must do if in fact we want to make our mission and other details uh, highly visible to the public. At the bottom of the screen, I just shared a short mission statement from a library that I just uh, found uh, randomly. And uh, you can see that the mission is stated in only one sentence. I'm, I'm, I challenge you to think about that and, and to use the ALA's guidance to say, is this enough or should there be more? On this screen, I'm sharing with you the core values of librarianship. And I, I'm not gonna go over each one of them. We don't have time for that today, but I want you to know that these core values are certainly the guiding light in professional librarianship. Um, I also want you to uh, be very familiar with the uh, First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution and how what freedom we have as a result of that First Amendment. And some of you may not want to be bogged down by this or have to even think about it, but it really is so central 
to overcoming this threat of, of censorship. So the First Amendment gives everyone residing in the U.S. the right to hear all sides of every issue and to make their own judgments about those issues without government interference or limitations. It allows people to speak, publish, read, and view what they wish, to worship or not worship as they wish, to associate with whomever they choose, and gather together to ask the government to make changes in the law or to correct the wrongs in society. And it gives us the right to speak and the right to publish under the First Amendment. And the Supreme Court has affirmed that the right to receive information is a fundamental right protected under the U.S. Constitution when it considered whether or not a local school board violated the Constitution by removing books from a school library. So this was a Supreme Court decision in 1982 which said to a local school board, by censoring those materials, you've violated the constitutional rights of the, of the people in this community. So uh, folks, I want to remind you that this Supreme Court decision is still on the books. And while a lot of people would like to redefine it, it hasn't been done and it will take a great uh, deal of effort, I'm pretty sure, to make that happen. I also want to point out to you that there are a number of freedoms of fr speech that are protected and some that are not protected. So it's not an everything goes kind of a situation. And we've just talked about um, uh, the freedoms. And I also want to mention uh, what isn't is not protected speech. And while there are some um, scholarly differences about these particular categories, these are the main categories of unprotected speech. And they are obscenity, fighting words, defamation, child pornography, um, perjury, blackmail, incitement of imminent lawless action, true threats and solicitations to commit crimes, and also plagiarism or copyright material is, uh, is uh, not protected, plagiarism of copyrighted material. I'm sorry, I misspoke there. So keep those things in mind as you're uh, remembering what's meant by intellectual freedom as is supported by the U.S. Constitution and the First Amendment. I'm going to talk to you just a little bit before I stop about um, about the sort a little bit about the, an overview of reading practices. I don't think it's too common in discussions about censorship to bring up the issue of reading practices, but I think it's really important for all of us to recognize that as professional librarians, the people in personnel working in libraries, that reading practices have been of high interest to our field for a long while. And I do believe that because of what we were seeing in society, they've um, sort of gained um, uh, another, another round of interest. I uh, am not going to go through the article published by uh, Dr. Jennifer Steele at the University of Southern Mississippi, but I highly recommend it if you could can possibly read it. And she concludes by saying that while some people will find it will, may find it hard to allow these controversial materials to con continue to take up residency in their libraries, it is not up to them to decide how people should live their lives or what they should read. So this business of silencing has and can keep society from talking about many issues, particularly issues that some find controversial or uncomfortable to discuss. Keep thinking about that. It's an important statement that Dr. Steele sh shares with us. Dr. Emily Knox has uh, spent a great deal of time thinking about worldviews of people who challenge books, and she's done it uh, around the idea of reading practices and beliefs over time, 
And this is one of the books that I mentioned to you the, today and hope that you will take an interest in and read. I'm going to just real quick uh, move you through three periods uh, of time that I think uh, make sense uh, related to understanding what we're seeing in our society today. And so um, please uh, hang in there with me while I take this brisk squawk over a, a quite a few years. So um, in the Middle Ages, as all of you probably remember, writing was the medium of authority and reading was controlled and limited. It was limited because there were very few people who could read and those who did read were reading scripture. And reading practices were typically silent reading, where it, whereas one's thoughts and interpretation was private, so others didn't know what the reader was reading or thinking. That started to change quickly with the invention of the, um, the Gutenberg Press, and, um, and then in the early modern period, there were more texts printed and more unmediated uninterpretation of texts. There was increased distribution of text, increased, increased literacy, and there was a period of time of religious upheaval and uh, that brought about the belief that each person can read and understand for themselves the truth of the Bible. Uh, there was um, interpretation of text was not controlled during this period of time as it once had been. And there was the dominant view that the act of reading a book, particularly the Bible, could save uh, one's soul. And now to the modern period, uh, the 1800s to the present, we certainly have ex know that there has been a print explosion. There's been secularization of reading. There has been uh, uh, re much reading done uh, besides only reading the Bible. Humans have begin to be viewed as having rational thought and ability to apply their own ideas to texts. Rational thought, it began to be coupled with the idea of common sense. And there has been the view that rational people can control their imagination and maintain distance from the effects of common sense reading, while others, particularly children, are not intellectually capable or developmentally able to do that. And then um, the, there's, there became the idea of undisciplined imagination. Uh, it became view, viewed as a potential problem. And the problem is that many think that if my child reads a certain thing, then they will become that certain thing. So these are some of the big picture ideas about reading practices and beliefs behind the practices that have changed over time. Uh, some, but some of them uh, still tend to be with us today. It's really important to mention that now at the present time, um, because of the internet, because of the invention by Mark Zuckerberg, that Facebook has connected billions of people around the world. And I think that many of us thought, myself included, that while neutral social media could be a democratizing force in society, um, Major social media platforms, as you well know, are not neutral. So many of those platforms are deliberately designed to manipulate, to manipulate one experience on the platform in ways that change how people think and behave. And these platforms uh, do that by what they show us and by eliciting certain emotions and behaviors from us. And so it's a very different a kind of a situation where reading is concerned. There are lots of people, as you know, doing reading on the internet and never questioning uh, the source of authority. So what can, what can uh, librarians do uh, in response to challenges? Well, here, here, here's the bottom line, I think. Libraries as public institutions, we ensure access we, we're not defenders of content. Libraries must have 
time, place, and manner rules that follow government laws. And it is the responsibility of libraries to provide access to information as protected by the First Amendment. And our board members, and sometimes we call them trustees, must take an oath to set aside personal conviction and follow laws. So we must respond to challenges in a proactive way with library policies. And we at SLIM teach our students about collection development policies, about meeting room policies, about display policies and patron behavior policies, and about internet use policies. That's only a, a, a part of them but I think a pretty comprehensive list. So when you're on the front line of the library and you encounter someone who wants to challenge a book, here are some uh, suggestions that the American Library Association has shared. At this website, these each one of these suggestions are outlined with much more detail, but here they are in a nutshell. They first say, acknowledge that everyone has the right to question and do not promise to act or appear to agree. They say, explain while something offends a person, others may not have the same perspective. And then if concerned about children or youth, explain that parents and guardians must play a role in guiding their own children. And sometimes people just want to be heard. So we should uh, be good listeners and then thank them. And if this doesn't satisfy the discussion or the situation, we must explain the formal reconsideration policy. That's also called the, the challenge policy. And I put this in bold letters because I think it's so important that we must have and use a reconsideration uh, policy form. And we must do that uniformly and consistently. There's a great deal to indicate uh, from what I'm reading that this that that there are many situations where the reconsideration form is not used is not being used uniformly and consistently and when it is used there are much fewer uh, incidents of of book challengers going forward uh, beyond the point of simply pointing out that they they don't like one thing or another um, there's a librarian in New Jersey. Her name is Martha Hickson, and she has recently pointed out that the ALA's template uh, needs some updates. And so uh, I'm showing you here uh, how it is that um, librarians have recommended that the challenge policy be more specific and more clear on many levels. And so um, I want you to take a look at how to update your book challenge forms. Uh, if you just go to the bookriot.com and search for book censorship news May 6, 2022, you'll see the long list of details that should be included in a challenge policy. And folks, I just cannot recommend this enough. It is really very thoughtfully done. It's very clearly outlined, and it's certainly very doable. So I'm going to wrap this up now by just um, asking us all to sort of lean back in our chairs and think, what, what do librarians mean to you? And uh, on this screen, I have a quote by Laura Bush, which I think is a good place to start when we consider what libraries mean to us. She said, libraries allow children to ask questions about the world and find the answers. And the wonderful thing is that once a child learns to use a library, the doors to learning are always open. I want you to keep thinking about that statement and answer this question for yourself. Do it often and do it with a passion for libraries that makes information access to all members 
of the library's community. I think it's really important for us all to keep a growth mindset. As many times as we attend a, a, a webinar or a session of this kind, I'm pretty sure there'll be something that useful to us that we can learn still more about. And I think we must always be learning as much as we can. And we must teach others about the dangers of censorship and the benefits of information access. I also think it's really important at this time for us to know laws and to know who our lawmakers are and to be well informed and to always vote. And so I think I'm almost to the end here. This very last slide is what I think are some reasons why libraries really matter. I have listed uh, what I saw on a particular library's website about what you can get at the library with a library card. It's a long list of things in addition to, to books. I also just uh, um, sort of serendipitously happened upon a lovely um, trail tale. That's hard to say, isn't it? Library trail tale that is organized around a, in a park around a lake. And you can see that along the walkway, the library has put these stands that include uh, a book. And for this particular uh, trail, they use the book Stand Tall Molly Lou Mellon by Patty Lovell. And uh, kids during the summer, as they walk around that park, they have a chance to see the book and to think about the story. It's a great idea. I couldn't help but share it with you because there are so many wonderful things going on at libraries. We simply can't let anything happen to, to this progress that we're making in society through libraries. And so um, I'm uh, gonna stop the slideshow here in a minute and ask you to just visit with me. And um, I'm hoping that you have some comments that you would like to share or questions that we could entertain uh, in the time that we have left. So if you'd like to speak, please just jump.